Excuse me. Okay, thank you for the kind introduction. I will talk today about uncertainty estimation in neural networks and give a introduction into the topic. And I will uh, introduce a method which I think is very good suitable, suited for a first introduction into the topic. First, I want to motivate uh, what I'm doing and the motivation is that neural networks are very successful and they are, there's a fair bit of hype around them. So uh, they are applied in ever more domains and one has to be very careful if you uh, apply them in safety critical applications. For example, let's suppose we've trained a neural network which uh, uh, to classify the skin lesions to be either, either benign or malignant. So, uh, and let's further suppose we did a good job at training this neural, neural network and we can classify this image as being benign and this is correct and we uh, give benign a very high confidence. So we have a happy patient because the the uh, skin lesion is uh, good, <laughs> let's say. And we are happy because we did a good job in uh, training this neural network. But now what happens if we present the uh, neural network an image which is, for example, blurred, or we could also think of a cropped image which only gets parts of the skin lesion. What does the neural network tell us now? So. We would want it to tell us something about 0.5 for benign and 0.5 for malignant because it, it's telling us, I don't know, it could be either. So the question of this talk is, does, does the neural network know what it does not know? And to explore this further, I use the MNIST data set, which is a very famous data set, I think which consists of handwritten digits from zero to nine, and you have to classify them in the corresponding classes. And I trained a neural network on the 50,000 training samples and uh, tested it on a different test set of uh, 10,000 samples and got an accuracy of 97%, which is good, but uh, not so important for our task. Um, and now I was looking uh, at the confidence of those prediction and I set everything where the predicted class has a predicted probability of over 0.9. Uh, I would see this as a high confidence predict prediction and I got uh, on 98% of the test samples, we had a high confidence prediction. To explore this even further, we look at the predictive entropy, and this is defined for one prediction. The predictive entropy is defined as the negative sum over all classes with the predicted probability for this class and the logarithm of this predicted probability. So it's maximal for the most uncertain uh, prediction, which is assigning each class a probability of one over C, where C is the number of classes. And it's minimal for a very certain prediction where we assign one class a, a probability of one and all the other classes a probability of zero. And now we can plot this for all, our whole test set. And we can see that this is very much at the zero, which is the lowest value. This is not a proper histogram, it's a kernel density estimate because I was doing this following another paper doing a similar thing and they also did this. But if we would have a proper histogram, which I have in the appendix, if anyone wants to see, it's even more extreme where in the first bin, which is from zero to 0 0.02, uh, or, almost all of the samples lie. 
But now we have seen only what happens if we show the, the network something it has already seen in training or similar things. It comes from the same distribution as the training samples, let's say this way. But now what happens if we show the neural network, which was trained on handwritten digits, we show them items of clothing, for example. And I used the fashion MNIST data set because it's very convenient as you can, it, it has the same size and it's also grayscale images. So you can just show it to the network without other pre-processing. And we find that this network, which was trained on numbers, has on the 10,000 fashion items, uh, it has a high confidence prediction in almost 79% of the cases. So if we look at the predictions in this, uh, for these images, we see that this predicts to be a two, the shoe is a, a, sh a two with a confidence of one and all the other samples also have very high confidence. These are the first five samples of the data set. So I didn't pick anything there. And even this, which doesn't fall under my definition of high confidence prediction is still, it is very certain that this is in fact a zero and not a shirt or something with a confidence of 78%. So we can uh, well visualize it even further if we compare the fashion MNIST and the MNIST uh, data sets with the predictive entropy, we can see both of them ha are heavily in the lowest entropy, even though in the fashion MNIST there are some which have a little higher entropy as well, but most of them are at the zero. So uh, this is not very good, but we, I want to show you a method where you can do something better. And the method is called dropout for uncertainty estimation in neural networks. And it was introduced by Garamani and I GAL 2016 at the ICML. So first, uh, what is the dropout part? Dropout is a method which prevents overfitting. So it's a regularization technique, which is often used in neural networks. And I'm sure of everyone of you who uses neural networks has heard of it. And it's pretty simple, it simply during training, it randomly switches off nodes in the neural network. So if we have this schematic neural network of two layers and four nodes each, in the first training batch, for example, this and this node is switched off and it trains like they weren't there. And in the next training batch, two other nodes are switched off and so on and so on. So this leads the network to uh, learn some representation, which is uh, kind of robust. So it can't rely heavily on single nodes because they might be switched off in training. So this is what the motivation for dropout was. It still is, of course. But now we want to use it for uncertainty estimation. So I will first introduce the framework of Bayesian learning. We normally in neural networks, we have networks like on the left-hand side here, where every rate and parameter is just a value. And we want to find the best value for this. And now in the Bayesian setting, we, we replace each parameter with a distribution. So um, we don't have, for the weights, we don't have parameters, but distributions. So to predict in this setting, we also get a probability distribution. And this is defined by the integral over uh, the whole parameter space, which is d omega. And we have here the first part is the prediction of uh, a single network with parameters omega and input x. And uh, 
the prediction is y hat. Ah, I forgot to mention this. D is the data, the training data we see. So this integral is actually an average over all predictions of all possible neural networks. But the prediction is weighted with the posterior distribution of the weights, which is this. So the probability of the weights given the training data. So this second part is, of course, kind of hard to compute. This whole integral is, you have to understand, is quite hard to compute because this is very high dimensional because the uh, parameters of a new neural networks are usually very high dimensional. And so this integral is already very hard, but this posterior is again very hard. So we can write this as with the base rule, we can write it as a product of the likelihood and the prior, which are depending on what prior you pick, kind of easy com to compute, I would say. But here the evidence is again an integral over all uh, possible parameters and again, very hard to compute. So this Bayesian setting is very nice, but we have two integrals with which are very hard to compute, but how can we uh, do it a little bit simpler? Um, for this, I will show a method called variational inference. And I would say variational inference methods are at the mo moment the most popular uh, for those uncertainty estimation in neural networks. And there you ap uh, approximate the posterior, which we cannot compute with a family of simple distribution called Q theta, which are specified by theta. And we have this family of distribution here and the posterior we want to approximate here, which is usually not within this family. And then starting at a random member of the family, we want to find the closest uh, to the posterior distribution and close in terms of the kudak leibler divergence. So to write it down more mathematically, we want to find the theta, which minimizes the kuhlberg leibler divergence between Q and the posterior. One might think here we have the posterior again, so which we cannot compute. So what, do, what does this help me? But if we uh, write this down, we can pretty easily see that we arrive at this loss function. So where the we don't have the posterior anymore so minimizing minimizing the term before is equivalent to minimizing this with respect to theta and this consists of two terms the first part here is the kuhlberg leibler divergence between q and the prior so it's the prior dependent part it's com the complexity cost which assures that you don't go let's say too far away from the prior. And the second part is the data dependent likelihood cost that assures that you fit the data well. So it's a trade off between staying close to the prior and fitting the data well. And now we arrive at this simple algorithm. We uh, sample from this uh, Q, we just randomly initialize, or well, from this family we just thought of. And then we minimize one step this loss function with respect to theta, and then we sample from the updated distribution Q. And with, with this, we find after some time the proper Q. Now we want to uh, combine this with the dropout method I just mentioned. So we need to specify Q uh, such that it's equivalent of using dropout. And uh, for this, the theta is the um, weights of the uh, neural network. So MIK is the kth column of the uh, weight matrix corresponding to layer i. 
And now we can write this Q as a sum over all layers of the weight matrices for each layer. Uh, as a product, sorry. And um, we can write this Q as a product of the distributions for each weight matrix. And this distribution we can write as a product of uh, each column in this weight matrix. And for each column, we can write it as a mixture of two delta distribution. That means with probability P, we just put this column of the weight matrix to zero. And with probability one minus P, we put the proper values in there. And this is then the same as using dropout. So we can see that this is a probability distribution and it's written kind of com uh, complicated, but it's only so that we can see that it actually fits in this uh, definition of Q, but we can of course write it a little bit simpler we can just sample from a Bernoulli distribution and with probability P and then multiply the full weight matrix with a diagonal where we on the diagonal we have the sampled uh, entries from the Bernoulli distribution. And this way we just put those columns to zero where we, uh, where we sample the zero and then we have the weight matrix. So this algorithm just changes to uh, the sample procedure I just told you. So you uh, sample from the Bernoulli, update the weight matrix and use this for your, uh, for one step minimizing this loss function. And this loss function looks maybe a little bit complicated, but it is actually not that complicated because the first part is the negative log likelihood, which is a very common loss already in neural networks and in other terms of, as well, of course. And the second part, the kuhlberg leibler divergence between the uh, between Q and the prior is of course depending on the prior, but if you use uh, Gaussian priors, this is just equivalent to L2 regularization. So this is also already built in most packages for neural networks anyway. So it turns out that this is just, you can uh, do this if you just use standard dropout with L2 regular, regularization on the weights, you can do dropout with variational inference. The only difference is we also use dropout as a test time and average over several evaluation because um, we approximated this uh, posterior with the, uh, this dropout distribution. And now we sample from this integral because we can't compute over all possible weights. So we sample from this uh, integral to approximate this prediction. So, we have no additional training time because dropout doesn't require almost no additional training time because dropout doesn't require any time pretty much and you often use it already in neural networks anyways. But of course at test time, the evaluation is slower because you have to evaluate it several times and average over it. So. There, there's a drawback as well, of course. So if we go back to the motivating example, we remember that we had uh, for our normal fully connected neural network, we had an accuracy of 97.4% and on 79% of the fashion MNIST data set, our network was still very uh, had still a very high confidence. So if we compare this to this method often referred to as MC dropout, uh, we have pretty much the same accuracy. This could, the difference could just be some random initialization or during training. But we have, we already see here the 
high confidence prediction of on the fashion MNIST data set are a lot lower. So only on 13% of the fashion MNIST state uh, samples, our uh, network was very high confident. And also, if we look at the predictive entropy, we can see we can pretty cre clearly distinguish those uh, both data sets. So we could, for example, set a threshold at 0.5 and everything higher than every sample which get a higher predictive entropy than 0.5 has to be handed back to a human expert who then uh, decides whether it's a handwritten digit or fashion item, for example, or in our more serious case in the skin lesion, then the human expert would need to examine the uh, photo of the skin lesion. So to summarize this method, I think dropout is an easy method for the first uncertainty estimation in neural networks as it's the most of it is already implemented in most neural network packages because yeah, because you already have dropout. And the only thing is that you need to keep it during test time and then average over several runs. It's also a probabilistic motivation for dropout because uh, in the beginning it was just a regularization technique which works very good, but now we have a other way to look at it from the probabilistic perspective. And the most important part for people who work with neural networks, even though the outputs of neural networks look a lot like probabilities, they are not very well calibrated for standard models. So you cannot think that your model knows what it does not know. So you need to get some kind of precaution for that. So this uh, was my talk. 